All right. So good morning to everybody and welcome to another day of class. So let's begin by reviewing our past lesson. Is it our last class or we have one more? Uh, we're supposed to have one more. We'll, we'll discuss that. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure. Thank you. Yeah. So any, any um, questions from what we did last time? All right, no questions yet. Okay. All right, so if there are no questions, then we would start now. All right, so basically this will be um, the last lesson for the class. I'm going to try to finish everything today, hopefully. Okay. And then, um, the next class will do a little practice um, on some questions, like a practice test. Okay. So today we want to discuss ecology, what ecology is. Okay. So when we say ec ecology, ecology is a study of the interaction of living things with each other and their physical environment. So how they interact with each other and their physical environment. So the living things on earth may be organized into four different levels of ecological organizations, right? Um, these levels of organization are one, we have population. So know the definition for population. When we say a population, we're talking about all the members of one species in an area all members of one species in an area. So let's say that you have like a dog, if it's like a dog population, okay, one species in an area. So that would be like a dog population, right? Then let's say human population and so on. So same species. Then we say a community. A community refers to all members of different interacting species in an area put together, in an area put together. So if you put all this together, then we will have a community. So this will be the community. Okay. Then the ecosystem refers to all members of the community plus the abiotic factors influencing them. So the fiscal factors influencing them. So if you have all the community plus what we call abiotic factors, a biotic or the fiscal factors, all this will form the ecosystem the ecosystem okay what are the abiotic factors abiotic factors would be things like temperature so if we take temperature for example those are abiotic factors like temperature takes anti pressure and so on, you know, humidity of the area. These are all fiscal factors. And so on, but these are examples. Okay, affecting the community becomes an ecosystem. 
then we say a biosphere a biosphere refers to the entire region of the earth where you find living things right so wherever you find living things on earth so that becomes the biosphere bio like uh, dealing with um living organisms okay. right so those are some quick uh, terms that you should um know right so now let's focus on nutritional interactions. This is a very important topic um, that you have to know very well. Nutritional interactions. Yeah. Okay. So have all the ecosystems must have three basic kinds of nutritional interactions in order to be stable and self-sustaining. So these nutritional interactions involve what we call producers so you have the producers then you have consumers and then you have what we call the decomposers three um, things producers consumers and decomposers right so what is a producer a producer so a producer is the organism okay the one that is capable of trapping sun's energy to make glucose sugar in the process of photosynthesis so first you have to do the producers so the in other words the producers they produce their own food right that's what it, this means using sunlight okay. then you have so example of that will be plants like the, like the plants so producers produce their own food So using the sun's energy. So in other words, they undergo photosynthesis. Okay. So examples we have here, you have the plants and algae. You know, these are examples. Okay. And another name for the producers is the word autotrophs. So we also call them the autotrophs. Autotrophs. That's another name for the producers. Because they produce their own food from organic substances. Okay. Then the second level of interaction is what we call the consumers. Uh, consumers over here. So the consumers are organisms that depend on, they depend upon and eat other organisms for their food, right? So they have to depend on other organisms. In other words, they cannot produce their own foods. Cannot produce their own food you know they have to depend on other organisms okay so another name that we give to the producers is the word heterotrophs heterotrophs so you see heterotrophs it means total consumers they can produce their own food if you see autotroph autotroph is like self feeding self feeding that's the meaning of autotrophs so so they make their own food so those are two key terms that you should remember um here okay and then there are different types of consumers so the first one is what we call the herbivore okay, herbivore they eat plants and then you have the carnivores the carnivores that feed on other animals and the omnivore they are consumers that eat both plants and animals, right? So those are the types of consumers that will come across, okay? Then the third level is the decomposers. 
decomposes. Okay. Now the decomposes, this is a special category of consumers. All right. Now what they do is that they break down um, the dead organism or the dead organic matter and they change it into simple nutrients which can be recycled in the ecosystem. All right. So this includes bacteria and, uh, and fungi. So in other words, it's like they recycle, you know, decompose it. The word decompose, break down. Okay. So those are the three levels um, of the food chain. The three levels. Okay. Right. Now let's talk about the concept of the food chain, the concept of the food chain. Okay. Now the food chain, this is a single chain showing all organisms eaten by another, which in turn is eaten up by another organism, right? So it shows, the, the diagonal shows uh, the feeding relationship, right? And this is how um it looks like so the food chain know the food chain very well you know it's not the qu questions of food chain are not difficult to answer you just have to use the diagram that is given to you and then understanding the terms that we are using here okay so the food chain begins with what called a producer that's what we have here the producer then you have the primary consumer they have the secondary consumer and they have what we call the tertiary consumer so it keeps going up like that in the quaternary and so on okay so it starts with the producer so the first organism to feed on the producer is the primary consumer and then the next one will be the secondary consumer tertiary consumer and so on right so that's a diagram of the food chain right here food chain so when you are given a diagram and you are reading, you just have to follow the arrow. You follow the arrow. And then it tells, so I'll give you an example um, soon. Now one level of, um, the level of interaction that is not shown on this diagram is that of the decomposer. So the decomposer is not shown on the food chain. So let's write that somewhere. The decomposer is not shown on the food chain. Okay, even though they form part of the food chain, right? They're important members of the food chain, but it's just not shown. So let's look at an example of the food chain. Okay, so this is an example of the food chain. All right, you have grass eaten up by grasshopper. And a grasshopper is eaten up by the toad. And the toad is eaten up by the snake. And the snake is eaten up by the hawk. All right, so you just follow the arrow as it's given. All right, you know. In other words, grass produces food for the grasshopper. Grasshopper is food for the toad. Toad is food for the snake. And the snake is food for the hawk. You know, that's how you, you read this. Yeah. Okay. That's a simple food chain, right? So a type of question that you could get would be something like, what will happen uh, when, let's say the grasshopper population goes down. So the grasshopper population goes down, if this goes down, what's gonna to happen to the population of the toad? Now the toad has no other food here, based on the diagram. No other food to feed on, grasshopper is gone. So it means that uh, the toad population is going to go down. Right, or they will die off, you know. 
based on this diagram. Okay. So you just have to answer the question based on the um, diagram given to you. Okay. Right. So an another way to represent the relationship is, is called the food web. So the food web, that's the other way. Food web. Now, if you look at the food web over here, say the most animals are part of more than one food chain and eat more than one kind of food in order to meet their food and energy requirements. Okay, so these inter interconnected food chains form what we call the food web, the food web, right? So the food web is made up of more than one food chain, you know, put together. So let's trace one of them. So example, let's say if I start here, I have grass, so grass, produces food for grasshopper. Grasshopper produces food for the toad. Toad is food for the snake. And snake is food for the hawk. Okay, so this is one uh, food chain, if I trace it that way. I can trace another food chain. If I start with grass, the grass produces food for rabbits. Rabbit is food for snake, I can go that way. And then the snake is food for the hawk. So that's another food chain. I see another one. Producer, so I have grass producing food for the rabbit, and then rabbit becomes food for the hawk. So that's another food chain. So three food chains here put together is what we call the food web, food web. So it's like a complex food, um, a complex food chain. All right, so again, how do you answer questions on these? You could be asked to identify the producer. So we can identify the producer here. So what is the producer? Again, we have a producer will be the, the grass. Okay, that's a producer here. Okay. Um, so which ones are the primary consumers? If I look at this, primary consumer will be grasshopper and rabbit. Okay, the first to consume the producer. So grasshopper and rabbit to be the first consumers. Okay, the first consumer. grasshopper and the rabbit. Okay. The first to feed on the producer. Okay. Then if you continue, so if you go this way, then the toad will be like a secondary consumer. The snake will be a tertiary consumer, right? And so on. And then hawk will be like a quaternary consumer. If I go this way, then the rabbit will be primary consumer, but snake here will be the secondary, and then hawk will be the tertiary. If I follow this food chain here, the green one, then the rabbit becomes a second primary consumer, and then the hawk will be the secondary consumer. So it is based on the food chain that you're looking at. Okay. Then another question would be like, what to be um, an important member of the food web that is not shown on the diagram that is not shown on the diagram so an important member of the food that's not shown in the diagram would be the decomposers right so the decomposers again are not shown here
they're not, they're not shown. But they're important members of the food web. Great. Another way we have a question will be like this. Now, what will happen to the, let's say, the toad population if the snake population goes down? Okay, what's going to happen? So, based on our knowledge, we can say that if the snake population goes down, that means this is down, then the total population would go up, you know, it's going to increase, okay, because there's, there's no snake to feed on the toad over here based on this food chain, right? Um, the same way, if the grasshopper population goes down, then it means that the toad population would, it would, would, would go down, but the toad has no other food to feed on than the grasshopper. Okay. Now let's look at a different option here. Now let's say that the toad population goes down. So let's say toad, this is down. So the toad population goes down, what's going to happen to the snake population? What's going to happen to the snake population? Okay. Now let's look at this carefully here. Even though the toad population is down, the snake still has an option. You know, the rabbit, it can get food from the rabbit, right? So because it can get from the rabbit an alternate source of food, then the snake population is unlikely to go down. Okay, we cannot say that it's going to go down. So it's unlikely to go down because it still has some food from the rabbit. Okay. So these are different ways in which you can ask questions based on the food web. Right. So that's what I'm saying. There are easy questions to answer if you know. You just have to follow the diagram that is given to you and then understand the key terms. Producers, primary consumers, decomposers, um, and um, what will happen when a population goes, you eliminate one of the popular, um, what do you call it? one of the members of the food chain or the food web. Okay, so that's how they ask the questions on the food chain. Okay. And then there's also one more way in which the food web is represented. One more way. And that is the food pyramid, what we call the food pyramid. So the food pyramid looks like this. Okay. So basically, you have the same categories or levels of interactions. You have the producer from the base. So that's the producers from the base here. Then you have the primary consumer. You have the secondary and then tertiary. Okay. So as you go up the population, um, decreases okay because you need more of those below the lower levels to produce food for those in the upper level the upper levels they become bigger and bigger organisms as you go up there right so we have grasshopper for example grasshopper producers follow so grass producers here followed by grasshopper and then you have the toad secondary consumer and then you can have let's say um snake over here you know share consumer and so on so that's the food chain so the same type of questions what will happen if one of the members um you, you take out one of the levels or one of the members of this food chain what's going to happen the same type of questions and you should be able to explain them okay okay so that's the food um web okay. um sorry the food pyramid any questions so far on the food chain, food web, and the pyramid? No, so far so good. So far, good, right. 
Um, I'll try to finish so that we can answer a lot of questions from the book today. Okay. Um, so let's read this one. It says, so this interdependence of populations within a food chain helps us to maintain the balance of plant and animal populations within the community. For example, when there are too many grasshoppers, there will be insufficient trees and shrubs for all of them to eat. Many grasshoppers will starve and die. Fewer grasshoppers means more time for the trees and shrubs to grow to maturity and multiply. Fewer grasshoppers also means less food is available for the toads to eat and some toads will starve to death. When there are fewer toads, the grasshopper population will increase. So for example, a question like predict the effect of low population of snakes in the pyramid above. Uh, which category of consumers, uh, category of consumer organism is usually not shown in the food chain web or food pyramid? Right? So these are some of the questions that I just uh, discussed, you know. Good. Then the other feeding relationships that I want to introduce to you. And this is what we call symbiosis, symbiosis. Okay. So this describes long-term relationship between two or more organisms. So the keyword is long-term relationships. between two or more organisms. Okay. Now, the first one is parasitism. We have parasitism, and the second we have mutualism, third, saprophytism, and the fourth one is called commensalism. commensalism. So let's look at parasitism. So think of the word like parasites, you know, so under this relationship, one organism feeds on another and causes injury or harm to it. So the important keyword here is the fact that there's an injury or harm caused to the organism. You know, so any relationship where there's injury or harm caused to organism is a parasitic relationship. So parasitism. Okay. So example. Let's say bed bugs feed on the blood of human beings. It's causing harm to the human being. So that's parasitism. Tapeworm in the intestines of human beings. Parasitism. Plasmodium falciparum, which causes malaria in human beings. It's all parasitism. Right? Because they cause an injury. The organism causes injury to another one. Okay. So in the question, if you notice this injury being done to another organism, then you think of parasitic relationship, parasitism. Yeah. Then the next one is neutralism, mutual. Think of the word mutual. So mutualistic association, mutualism. Like a mutual fund. You all benefit from if you put money together, both benefits. So this is a type of association in which both organisms benefit from the relationship. So there's beneficial both benefits from the relationship. Okay. Examples. If you take the, the, the bird called the auspecus, so the, the auspecus, the auspecus land on rhinos or zebras, and then they eat ticks and other parasites that live on the skin. I'm sure if you watch the TV sometimes on this science channels and National Geographic and so on, you see those birds, they, they land on the back of the zebras and rhinos, and then they feed on ticks on their skin. So what are they doing? What they are doing basically is to relieve the zebra or the rhino of the parasites, you know, and then they in turn are getting food from the uh, by eating the ticks. So there's a beneficial relationship. So the auspecus get food, and the rhinos or zebras are relieved of the pest. Okay, so this is a beneficial relationship. 
to that mutualism. Um, then I have another example, um, the spider crab and algae. So the spider crabs live in shallow areas of the ocean floor where um, they are easily preyed upon by other sea creatures. Now the greenish brown algae lives on the back of the crabs. Now this makes them blend with, in with the environment, okay, so that they become unnoticeable to predators. Okay. Uh, so they both benefit because the algae gets a good place to live and then the crab is also uh, also gets camouflaged you know so there's a beneficial relationship here all right um, another good example is a bee and a flower the bee and a flower so the bees fly from flower to flower gathering nectar which they turn into food so while feeding on the nectar the bees get some pollen on their hairy bodies the pollen is transferred to the next flower when the bee lands on it, leading to pollination. So in this mutualistic relationship, the bees get their food, you know, and then the flower plant, the flowering plants get uh, get to reproduce. Okay, so those are beneficial relationship. Bees get food for nectar, and then um, the pollination, the flowers also get uh, pollinate, uh, pollinated. And as we said last time, pollination leads to fertilization, and fertilization will lead to seed production. You know, so the plants reproduce itself through this process. So, so know some of the examples of mutualism. Keyword: both organisms benefit. Then we have the other one called commensalism. Commensalism. So in commensalism, in this relationship, only one of the organisms benefits. The other one does not benefit or get injured, right? Only one benefits, so that's the key. There's no injury to the other one, and there's no benefit to the other one. So only, right, commensal. Let's look at some examples. All right, so example will be the shark and the remora fish. The shark and the remora fish. Now again, if you watch the TV, those science channels again, or National Geographic, you notice that if um, under the sea, when a shark is swimming, you have those small, small fishes that swim alongside it, right? So the remote fish feeds on the crumbs that fall out of the mouth of the shark. The remote fish ben benefits from feeding on the crumbs, but the shark does not benefit or lose. The shark does not benefit or lose, okay? So there's no harm done to the shark as well. So this is an example of um, commensalism. Okay. Only the remora is benefiting from the food crumbs. For the shark, it is like a waste. Yeah. Then you have the cattle and the cattle egrets. So the cattle egrets, are birds that live near cattle. So when the cattle graze, so when they are feeding, their movements stir up insects. So as they feed, their movement drive away, um, like they stir up the insects around where they are feeding. So once they stir up the insects, then the birds feed on the insects. So the birds have their insects and then the cattle are unaffected. Okay. So the, only the birds are benefiting. The cattle doesn't benefit from this relationship yeah. so those are examples of commensalism only one organism benefit benefits there's no injury to the other one as well okay. then the fourth type of relation um long-term relationship or symbiosis is saprophytism saprophytism so it's saprophyte so when you say saprophytism, we talk about a relationship that involves organisms feeding on non-living 
So the keyword is feeding on a non-living thing, non-living. Okay. So the organisms are referred to as saprophytes. Saprophytes. Um, example: If you take mold and bread, mold and bread. Mold is a living organism, right? Uh, the mold is a fungus that feeds on the bread, which is non-living. The bread is a non-living organism. So this is an example of what we call saprophytism, okay. feeding on the non-living thing. Okay. So those are the four types of long-term relationship that I want you to um, remember and some of the examples that you should keep in mind. Okay. So commensalism, saprophytism, parasitism, and mutualism, okay. four key terms okay anybody has any question on these terms no okay uh, please feel free for a question you can raise your hands and then i would pause to answer okay. okay so that should be enough for the food chain and then the feeding relationships. We'll see more questions from the book later. Okay. okay. All right, so let's quickly look at mixtures. Mixtures. Okay. So when I say a mixture, a mixture consists of two or more substances that have been combined such that each substance retains its own chemical identity. Okay, so a mixture, mixing two or more substances. Um, they maintain their own chemical identity. In other words, there's no chemical reaction occurring between the substances you know, being put together. No chemical reaction. So this is like a fiscal interaction, not a chemical change. Okay, right. So that is the combination of substances which are not chemically joined together, all right? Now the key characteristics are, one, they have the same properties as their components. So if I mix, let's say water and salt, the water will maintain its properties, the salt will maintain its property, right? Because there's no chemical interaction between the two, okay? Now there's no fixed proportion between the components. In other words, you can, mix them anyhow you can put more water less salt more salt you know. there's no fixed combination proportion between the two then the components can be separated from the mixture which way to separate the components you know because there's again there's no chemical combination or reaction okay so that's what a mixture is about you know they maintain the property component maintain the properties you can separate them the mixtures, and then there's no fixed proportion between the components. You know. um, examples of mixtures, you have salt, sugar and salt. Air is a mixture of gases, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide. Flour and sugar, mixture. Salt and sand, mixture. Salt and water, okay, these are all different uh, mixtures that we can come up with, all right? Now, what are the types of mixtures that we have? Types. Okay. So let's narrow down to the types of mixtures. So there are three types of mixtures here. You have solution, then you have suspensions, and then you have what we call the colloids. Okay. Solutions, suspension, and colloids. So let's look at so solution. So when you take a solution, a solution is a homogeneous mixture homogeneous mixture i made a homogeneous in bold um because it's a term that you have to also know when i say homogeneous it means that there's no no boundaries visible in the entire mixture uh, entire solution right so if i put salt in for example if i put salt in water i dissolve salt in water i cannot see the salt and uh, I'll not be able to identify the salt in, in, in the solution, right? So there's no boundary between the salt and the water. I only see one face, what we call the one face.
only one face. Okay, so there's no boundary between the two. The salt and water. So this is homogeneous mixture. I just see only one face, no boundaries. Okay. So homogeneous means no boundaries visible in the entire solution. Okay. The major component is what we call the solvent. So the water is the solvent. And then the minor component is the solute, right? So the dissolved the, the dissolved substance is known as the solute. And then the substance that does the dissolving is known as the solvent. Yeah, the solvent. So the water is a solvent, and then the, for example, so in the salt solution, the water is a solvent and the salt is the solute. Okay. Now the component in the solution may not be may not be separated from the solution by leaving it to stand or by filtration. Okay. So if you leave it, the salt will not separate from the um, from the water. Okay. And then we can also not use filtration. That's a method of separation of mixture. One of the methods. You cannot use that to separate the salt and the water in this case, right? So you can use filtration for solutions. And then there are different degrees of saturation, different degrees of saturation. Okay. So the first one, a solution can be unsaturated, it can be saturated or be uh, super saturated super saturated so a solution that is unsaturated means that it um it can dissolve more solute at a given temperature so a solution is unsaturated if it can dissolve more solute at a given temperature so let's say room temperature if, if i put salt in uh, water or sugar in water it's going to dissolve and I can keep adding more sugar or more salt. It will keep dissolving and dissolving and dissolving until it gets to a certain point where it will not dissolve um, again, right? So at the point where it keeps dissolving at a particular temperature, that is known as the, and we say that the solution is unsaturated because it can take in more, all right? Then the solution becomes saturated if no more solute can be dissolved with the temperature remaining constant, right? So if I keep, as I said, if I keep adding more salt or sugar to the water, it will keep dissolving to get to a point. You notice that it's not going to dissolve um, again, you know, at a particular, like at the, at the temperature that you're working with, let's say the room temperature, okay? So at that point, we say that it's saturated, right? But if I put this in, on, on a um, let's say on, on fire. If I I heat this up, if I increase the temperature, I can keep adding more of the salt. It's still going to dissolve, right? So the temperature increases solubility. So one of the key things factors temperature increases. solubility you know, so as you increase the temperature more of the solute would dissolve right keep dissolving you know, that's why the temperature um has to be kept constant for, for it to be to say saturated it should be at a particular temperature you know because if we change the temperature it will dissolve more you know so it's, it's not going to be saturated at a, at that particular temperature if you keep increasing it but as you keep increasing more or the solute, it gets to a point, you know, no matter what you do, even when you increase the temperature, no matter what you do, it's not going to dissolve again. At that point, we say that the solution is super saturated, super saturated. So the super saturated means that it contains more solute than it would dissolve 
you know, more so than it would dissolve. Okay. So a supersaturated solution contains more solute than it would, it would if the dissolved solute were in equilibrium with the undissolved solute. So there's nothing else, you cannot dissolve anything again, no matter what you do. It's, it's super saturated. So those are the different levels of saturated uh, saturation uh, for solution. Okay, solution. Then we, we mentioned suspension. Suspension. Now suspensions, which is the second type of mixture. A suspension is a mixture of liquids with particles of a solid, which may not dissolve in the liquid. All right, so we have particles um, suspended in the liquid. They, they just float in the liquid. The solid may be separated from the liquid by leaving it to stand or by filtration, right? Or by filtration. Uh, for example, let's take something like uh, sand in water. Okay. So that would be like a suspension, you know. Or if you dissolve like clay in water, it's like a suspension. Yeah. Um, it, so that's why some uh, medications, like a you have like powder in powder substance in water, you know, so before you give it, you have to shake, just shake it before you, you give it, you know, because once you leave it, the particles separate, you go to the bottom of the liquid, suspensions. Okay. Then the third type is the colloids. Third type of mixture is the colloids, okay. So these are homogeneous or non crystalline substances consisting of large molecules or particles of one substance it is uh, dispersed through a second substance. So we use the word dispersion. So like scattered, you know, within the first substance scattered within um, a second substance. So the word is dispersed, dispersed through a second substance. Now examples of colors are gels, Sols and emulsions. Okay, so these are three examples of colloid. It could be a gel, it could be a sol, it could be emulsion. Right now, the particles do not settle and cannot be separated out by ordinary filtration or centrifuge, like those in a suspension. Right, so colloids are like in between uh, suspension and uh, what do you call it? And so. Uh, True solutions. Okay, so somewhere between like solution and suspension. Okay. So let's look at some examples of. So the first one is like the emotion. What's the emotion? So the emotion, this is a fine dispersion of minute droplets of one liquid in another, in which it is not soluble or miscible. Okay. So we have minute droplets of one liquid in another. Okay. So that is a colloidal suspension of one liquid in another. Emotions may be temporary or permanent. Temporal ones separate when left to stand for some time. Okay, so some, that's what I said again, if you have a colloid, you have to shake it sometimes. Yeah, if, it, if it's separate. Okay. So those are the un unstable ones. Now, stable ones, they don't separate. Now, examples of, you know some examples of emotion, like we have oil and vinegar. It's a temporary emulsion, oil in vinegar. Okay. Uh, mayonnaise is egg yolk in oil. That is a colloid. It's, it's, a, it's an example of a colloid, you know, but under the group emulsion, okay, the emulsion group. Uh, but those are permanent emulsions. The mayonnaise is like a permanent emulsion, so it doesn't separate, right? Yeah. So, know some of the examples of 
emotions, emotions. Okay. And in the soil, soil are colloidal suspensions of small solid particles in a continuous liquid medium. So we have this time you have solid particles in a liquid medium. Example, if you take blood, you know, you have small small particles suspended in the liquid, which is a plasma. If you take pigmented ink and paints, paints, you have solid particles in suspended in continuous phase, right? So that those are examples of um, soil. So he said, if the dispersion medium is water, the colloid is referred to as hydrosol, hydrosol. And if it's air, we call it aerosol, right? So there's a hydrosol, aerosol, okay? So something like the paint will be like hydrosol or the ink, hydrosol, blood will be like a hydrosol. And then if the particles are suspended in air, they have aerosol. And the aerosol, that's why like the containers um, under pressure, that you press and then like the spray, those type of sprays, those are um, aerosols. Then gels, gels are colloids that are more solid than the soils. You know, they are, they are more solid, the gels. So the gel, the, 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 the dispersed phase has combined with the dispersion medium to produce a semi-solid material. An example is like jelly, okay, jelly. So the dispersed medium, the dispersed phase as combined with the dispersion medium okay, to produce a semi-solid material. So jelly is an example of this. Okay. So you should be able to identify different types of colloids, you know, emulsions, soil, and gel. Emotion, salts, and gel, right? And then the different examples. Okay. All right. Any questions on solutions, mixtures, colloids? Okay. Uh, no hands up. All right. All right. Let's look at this one. We'll look at this one quickly. Um, so something called the electroscope. So the electroscope is used to detect the presence of static electricity. Static electricity. That's what electroscope is used for. Um, if you, in cold water, when you touch uh, the key, and let's say your door knob or certain materials, you get those electric shock, you know, that's the static, right? Um, it's used to separation of charges within the material, ele electrons within the material, right? Um, to detect the presence of charge on any material, we use what we call the electroscope. It's a very simple um, equipment or instrument that I'm going to show you shortly. You know. So this instrument consists of two thin metal leaves, gold leaves. So that is what you have here. So this is these are the gold leaves. A, these are the gold leaves. Okay. And then this is a like a glass jar. Okay. And then this D and B is what we call the so the the, the metal hook. Okay, there's a metal hook here. And then D is a plate. Okay. 
So how do you use the electroscope? Okay. So when a negatively charged body is brought near the terminal of the electroscope, it will cause electrons to be repelled into the metal leaves. All right. A positively charged body attracts electrons out of the leaves. In either case, the leaves are now charged the same way as each other, and so they repel each other. The amount the open up is proportional to the charge of the source. Proportional to the charge of the source. Okay. So it means that the greater the electron, the amount of electrons that you have, or charge that you have, the greater the proportion. Right, so this is how it works. Let me illustrate that here. So this is the jar. All right, so if you bring, <coughs> let's say negatively charged object here, you know, let's say you comb your hair and then the, the, the comb becomes negatively charged. So I bring the charged material here. So let's say this is negatively charged. Okay. When you bring it to this plate, the negative charge is going to attract the opposite opposite charge. So it's going to, from the metal plate here. So this is going to attract positive charges. The positive charge will be attracted here. And then what happens? All the negative charges will be repel to the end of this rod okay so if we repel to the end of this rod it means that this leaflet the gold leaves will acquire a negative charge so this also the negative charge okay they are repelled to the end now you have two negative charges the leaves are negative charge opposite and like charges always repel so the plates move up they move away from each other they repel each other. Okay, that's what happens. Okay, so when you see that, then you can say that there's a charge on the material that you you um, you are holding. So it just helps to determine the presence of charges. Okay, the same way if I bring, let's draw another one. If this is positive charge, this is going to attract negative charges on this plate and then it's going to repel all the light uh, uh, the light charge to the other end or the, to the plates so this will come positive charge positive charge seeing the leaflets are positive charge then they repel each other so they're going to move apart so they're going to repel move up away from each other so that tells you there's a charge on the material that we are holding. Okay. So that's how the electroscope functions. Detection of charges. And as I said, the amount of the amount they open up is proportional to the charge of the source. So the more charges that you have on the material, the greater the leaves, the leaves move away, move apart. No. So that's elect electroscope. Okay. So you could have a question where they ask you what happens to the leaflets or the leaf, the gold plates or, or leaves when the gold, the gold leaves when um, you bring like a negative charge. To the plate here, what happens? They move, they stay together, they move apart, 
um, I don't know, I mean, and so on. Okay. All right, good. Any question on the electroscope? Questions on electroscope? Okay. All right, now let's look at waves. Let's discuss waves. Okay. A little bit of physics. So there are different types of waves. We have what we call mechanical and electromagnetic waves. Mechanical and electromagnetic waves. A mechanical wave requires a medium for its transmission, whereas an electromagnetic wave does not. Right, so that's a difference. Sound waves are mechanical waves. This is why sound does not travel in vacuum. And then you have light waves are electromagnetic waves. So light can travel in, in vacuum, right? So two types mechanical wave and then electromagnetic waves mechanical and electromagnetic those are types of waves mechanical and electromagnetic Okay, so here, no medium needed. You don't need a medium here. No, no, sorry. Mechanical, you need a medium, should be medium here. Mechanical wave, you need a medium. And then electromagnetic wave, this way, no medium needed. You don't need a medium here, right? So medium will be like for sound, you need air to be, uh, you need air in the space to transmit the sound, or you need something like water or wood. There should be something there for the sound to be uh, transmitted, right? So if there's vacuum, you cannot hear sound. By electromagnetic wave, can pass through anything. There's, I mean, if there's no air, it will still go through. So that's this vacuum to still transmit. We can feel the sun's radiation or the heat from the sun. We don't need a medium, you know, to feel the heat from the sun. So that would be an example of an electromagnetic wave. Radio waves. Radio wave. I don't need any medium for to. For radio waves to be transmitted, you know, so that's an example of electromagnetic wave light, electromagnetic wave. Right? So, know some examples of the electromagnetic waves light, x rays, microwave, radio waves, you know, they are all examples of electromagnetic waves. Now, every wave has these characteristics that I want us to discuss. And you should be able to identify those characteristics when given. And the first one is the wave, let's identify um, the wavelength. So let's draw out the way. Every wave has what we call the sinusoidal curve. It goes 
like this. Up and down like that. Okay. So that's a sinusoidal curve, right? So we have what we call the peak here is called the crest. And then the minimum point here is the trough. So the wave is made up of crest and troughs, crest and troughs. So that's another crest, that's another trough, crest and troughs. Okay. Now the distance <coughs> between two crests is a wavelength, right? So when you say a wavelength, the wavelength here means you see, this represents the length of one complete cycle, length of one complete cycle. So if I start from, this is the starting point, always the starting point here. And this line is called a reference line. Reference line. So the reference line is the starting point. If it starts here, it goes up, down, and back to this point, right? So that is one, <coughs> wavelength from here to this point here that's a wavelength <clears throat> it's one complete cycle up down and back from crest to crest <clears throat> from this point to that point that's also one complete cycle crest to crest so this is also a wavelength Yeah, so something's going around, it's like up, down, and back, down, and back. That's complete cycle. Starts down and back to original. Trough to trough. I can also come for another wavelength here from trough to trough. That's also a wavelength. So you can identify so many wavelengths on the diagram, okay. So when I come to this diagram on this side, and then say from point A to point E, that's a wavelength. So this is a wavelength from here to there. That's a wavelength. This is a wavelength. From B to F, this is a wavelength, and so on. Okay. Okay. I can say C to G. That's also a wavelength. This is also a wavelength here. Starts down, up, and back. That's a wavelength. Okay. Yeah. Then <coughs> we have what we call the amplitude. The amplitude is a maximum vertical displacement from the resting position. So the reference line is also known as the resting position. That's a reference line, rest the position. Okay. So the amplitude is going to be from the reference line to this point here. That's the amplitude. Amplitude. Okay, so this is also amplitude from here, the amplitude, all right, okay. Now we can also have an amplitude from the maximum displacement down. That will also be an amplitude. So let's get rid of this one.
All right, so this is an amplitude. From here, there, maximum displacement down, as I said, that's also an amplitude. Okay, amplitude. Now, how do you relate this to sound and hearing? Now, the size of the amplitude is related to the loudness of sound, the loudness or intensity of sound. So that's something that you remember. So the louder the sound, the greater the amplitude. You know, louder the sound, the greater the amplitude. So remember that connection. Loud sound, loud amplitude. Loud. loud sound goes with loud, so, sorry, large amplitude. You have low sound. Low amplitude. But that's how it's connected to hearing. Okay. Then another key term is the word frequency. Frequency. So frequency is the number of cycles per second. <coughs> the number of cycles per second. That is the frequency. And the frequency determines the pitch of the sound. Pitch of sound. All right, pitch. Okay. So the pitch is very high. Then we will have high frequency. If the pitch is low, low frequency, right? And this will be my frequency. If I take two diagrams like this, let's say if from here to there, let's say one, if I take one second interval, I'm going to draw another one for another one second interval. If I have this two cycles, let's say per second, that would be the frequency here, all right? Frequency, two complete cycles per second. And let's draw another one where we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So I have six complete cycles, one, one, two, one, 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 two, three, four, five. All right, so this one has more cycles within the same second than this one, All right? So this one have a high frequency, this high frequency. And this one have a low frequency because the number of cycles per minute, per second, unless. Number of cycles per second, that's the frequency. Okay. Right. So high frequency, high pitch sound. So high pitch, high frequency. low pitch, then we talk about low frequency, all right? So relate this to hearing um, of sound. Sometimes it comes up in questions, you know. High pitch, high frequency, low pitch, low 
frequency, loud sound, large amplitude, low sound, low amplitude. Okay, for hearing. Okay, great. So you should be able to identify the different components when you are given a diagram. For example, a diagram like this. You should be able to tell which one is the wavelength, which one is the amplitude, and so on. Okay. So the wavelength of the wave in the diagram above is given by which which letter will be the wavelength here? If anybody wants to respond? What will be the wavelength in this diagram? Somebody wants to try. Any volunteer for the wavelength? B to D. B to uh, let's uh, wavelength. Um, um, it should be one letter. One one letter. The wavelength. A. A. Yeah. A. That's a wavelength. Trough, a crest to crest. It's a complete cycle. So that's a wavelength. It is a wavelength. Okay. Um, then the amplitude. Amplitude D. of the yeah. Uh, which one? B or, B or D? Excuse me. Do you say B or D? Uh, I said D. D, yeah. D. So that is maximum displacement from the resting position. So D. D. Mm -hmm. All right. So radio waves are example of what type of waves? We mentioned that already. So that should be electro magnetic waves, electromagnetic waves. Okay. So these are some examples. We'll see more examples in the book um, later. Okay. All right, great. So she will be able to identify these things. Um, all right. Um, let's quickly go over enzymes. And then we'll look at the gas laws. <laughs> now we all know that enzymes are known as biological catalysts. Biological catalysts. Those are enzymes. Biological catalysts. So what's a catalyst? A catalyst is any substance that speeds up or can speed up the rate of chemical reactions. So they only speed up chemical reactions, catalyst. Keyword is speeds up reactions. Okay. Now note that they do not take part in a reaction. They don't take part in reactions. They are just there to speed up. Do not take part in reactions. They only speed up the reaction. Okay. So what happens? They remain unchanged at the end of the reaction. They are unchanged at the end of the reaction. Okay. Right. Um, enzymes are, as I said, are biological catalysts. In other words, they speed up reactions in the living organism. Okay. Biological catalysts. And one of the properties of enzymes is that they are specific. They act on specific substances. So they are specific. 
you know. So there's something called like the lock and key mechanism. Like for every lock, there's a particular key that fits. That's how the enzymes work. You know, that's what they are specific. They act on specific substances. So think about like a lock and key. So that's an old theory, okay. But now there are new theories about how specificity uh, works. You know, the enzyme it is believed to fold itself around the substance. So it has to fit perfectly. The fold has to fit. The wrapping up has to be perfect fit for the enzymes to work on that substrate. Um, so the enzyme acts on the substrate. Whatever it acts on is called a substrate. Okay. And the other thing is that the enzymes are proteins in nature. They are proteins. And because they are proteins in nature, you can easily destroy them. Enzymes can still be destroyed. And they can be destroyed by temperature or, and pressure, right? Temperature, pressure can affect um, the enzymes affected by temperature. They can also be affected by pH. pH can also affect them. Right. So enzymes work well within a narrow temperature range and a narrow pH range. So we call that the optimal, the optimal pH. Optimal pH and temperature. Those are the ranges that they work well. Range in which they work well. Optimal temperature and pH. If you go outside that, they don't function well. If you go the way we above that, it will above those ranges is going to destroy them and so on. Okay. So that's how the enzymes work. So I'm sure you come up if, if, in your biology classes, you may have come across graphs that look like this. You have the pH and then maybe the enzyme activity here. Then the drug graph that looks like that. Okay. So the enzyme functions well within a certain temperature range. If you go below that, it's a low performance. If you go outside that range, there's a low performance, but peak within a certain range of temperature. Okay. The same way with um, that's that's for pH, the same with temperature. Temperature is very similar. If you draw temperature, very similar in the enzyme activity. High temperature would denature them, would change the protein nature. When the temperature is too high, the activity will be low. When it's too low, it's not going to function well. So the, the best temperature can be around here, narrow temperature range. Okay, so those are a quick overview of what you should know on enzymes, their biological catalyst. Okay. Um, there are more enzymes, but we're not going to spend time on that one now. Okay, right. So let's look at the gas laws. That's a very important concept. Yes. Gas laws. Okay. Now, there are laws that govern how gases work. 
and that's what we want us to discuss now. The first one is known as Ball's Law. Ball's Law. So boss law for gases. So boss law, it says that at a constant temperature, temperature, the volume of a gas varies inversely as the pressure. That's what we call Bohr's law. All right, so the description I have here at constant t, as pressure increases, the volume decreases. Inverse relationship. So there's like the change in opposite directions. All right. Okay. So pressure up. When pressure is up, the volume is going to be down. That's the first relationship. When the pressure goes down, the volume will be up. Yeah. Inverse relationship. That's what we mean by inverse variation. Yeah. Inversely proportional. Okay. And mathematically, this is the formula, inverse relationship. So P, if you have initial pressure, find up initial pressure, initial volume, it should be equal to the final pressure times the final volume, inverse relationship. So if this is up, this is down. And now the product is constant. So if one changes that I want up, the other one has to go down, you know, to maintain the constant uh, value. Okay. Um, how do you apply this? You have to know application problems. Appli first application. Think about, let's say if I had a piston and plunger. or the pump, let's say a pump, tire pump, like this. So if the pressure, you increase the pressure, so this will be the volume here. Let's call this V1, and call this, let's say, the pressure here, P1. OK. If you increase the pressure, push it down, let's say P2, then the, pressure, the volume becomes smaller. The volume has gone down. So this is the volume when you increase the pressure. So pressure increase, volume down. So this explanation, one of the explanations. Okay. Mm -hmm. Biologically, we can also apply this to breathing, right? Breathing. Think about the thoracic cavity. You take the thoracic cavity, the lungs in there. And this is a diaphragm. You have the lungs in. Okay. Now, for us to take in air, the diaphragm will have to go down, right? It flattens. 
So the diaphragm will be a little flat. Okay. So what happens? It means that the volume here has increased. So volume up. Okay. So if a volume goes up, that means that the pressure will go down. Yeah, I was like, oh, we're going to leave until 11.30. Um, like 11.30, so she's been doing the job, I do, and I've been telling you. And somebody, can you mute yourself? There's somebody talking. If you can mute yourself, it's coming in here. No. Okay. All right, so the pressure goes down, and because the pressure is down, the air outside is going to rush in because the atmospheric pressure is higher than inside the thoracic cavity. So the pressure, um, the air will rush in. So that's inspiration. Inspiration. So during inspiration, the diaphragm goes becomes flat. So it, it goes down. Because it's gone down, the thoracic cavity, the volume has increased. Increased volume means that reduced pressure inside the thoracic cavity. So now the atmospheric pressure is higher. So that pushes the gas in, oxygen goes in. Right. So that's inspiration. So this is an example of Bohr's law. Let's go backwards. For expiration to, to uh, give out the carbon dioxide, was it's going backwards. So it's going backwards. So the thoracic uh, the diaphragm moves up, right? It moves up, so it contracts, moves up. So once it moves up, what's going to happen? The volume here is going to go down, and the thoracic cavity will be down. Once the volume goes down, then it means that the pressure inside will increase. So increase pressure in the thoracic cavity. So once the pressure is up, it means that it's going to push the gas out. So the carbon dioxide comes out. So that's expiration, respire. Okay. So all, all has to do with boss law. Boss law. Pressure up, volume down. Volume down, pressure up. That's boss law. Okay. Yeah. Then the second one, it's known as Charles law. Charles. This is Charles law. Okay. So Charles law says that at a constant pressure, as the volume increases, temperature increases. So we're talking about constant pressure constant pressure. So that is Charles law. So let's put that down, Charles law. Charles law. So it says that at a constant pressure, so the pressure is constant. The volume of a gas varies directly as the temperature. Okay. So that's a direct variation or the direct variation. So direct variation, as I've just said, it means that as the 
temperature goes up, if you increase temperature up, the volume goes up. If the temperature goes down, decrease temperature, the volume goes to go down. Same direction of change for direct variation. Okay. How can you remember this? You can remember this by thinking about the balloon. Think of the balloon. So take the balloon. If you increase the temperature, the air is going to expand, get bigger, 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 bigger. So here, temperature up, increase temperature, the volume would increase, it expands. So that's Charles' law. That's what Charles' law says. If you keep the pressure the same, constant pressure. Okay. So that's an application. Charles law. Okay. Then the last and the, the other gas law, the third part of the gas law is known as Gay Lussac's law. Gay Lussac. So let's go back and look at Gay Lussac's law. So Gay Lussac's law says that at a constant volume, this time the volume is constant. As the pressure increases, the temperature increases. That's Gay Lussac's law. Okay, so let's go over that. So Gay Lussac's law. So it says that at a constant volume, the pressure of a gas varies directly as the temperature. Okay. So as we said, direct variation means same direction of change, right? They change the same direction. So as you increase the temperature, pressure increases. And then the opposite will be as you decrease temperature on the gas, the pressure will also decrease. Same direction of change. Okay. So here, think about, um, let's say the take a Coke container, like a can of Coke. Okay. The volume is fixed. Right, so this is a fixed volume. If you increase the temperature, you realize that the pressure is in, goes up. It becomes the, the pressure inside builds up. So increase temperature, the pressure goes up. You know, it becomes very uh, turgid, high pressure. Then it starts bulging out. So that's application of that's an example of Gay Lussac's law. Gay Lussac's law. Okay. The other example will be if you're boiling, let's say you have water and you're boiling, you've covered the pan with a lid. You see that the pressure increases within the um, the container, and then the lead it ends up pushing up the lead. 
Okay, so that's another example that I can give. And then this, you apply fire here. So the pressure here, that's the gas here. So as you increase the temperature, you realize that the pressure also increases. So it's pushing up the lead. Yeah. The vapor pressure increases. So that is Gay Lussac's law. All right. So remember the three laws, the three main laws that I've spoken about for this test. Three main laws for this test. Um, the other ones are just combination of what I've just discussed. If you go back to the table, combined gas law. The combined law combines all these laws. You put all these laws together then you have the combined gas law. Yeah. So here the pressure is directly proportional to the temperature. So this is this, Gelusa's law is here. And then this is Bohr's law put together. And then this Charles law, this part V over T, Charles law. So you put all together, this is the formula that you come up with. But you will ask more of scenarios like I've discussed here. Yeah. And then you have what we call the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law, PV is equal to NRT. That's called ideal gas law. You know, um, in life, there's no ideal gas in, in particular. You know, um, in, um, ideal gas means that the, the attraction between the molecules is negligible. Right? There's no attraction between the gas molecules. You know. That's what's called ideal gas, but those are ideal situations. Okay. Right, so concentrate on Bohr's law, Charles law, and the Gay Lussac's law for your test. Okay. All right. All right. So this should be fine for gas laws. It should be fine for gas laws. Okay. Right. Um, any questions on the gas laws? gas laws or anything that we've discussed so far. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about radioactivity and what we call half-life radioactivity and half-life. Okay. Now, radioactivity is a random process. That happens naturally as the isotopes in a particular element decays. Okay, so we use the word decay. Decay means it disintegrates. So let's decay. When you see the word decay in chemistry means disintegrate. So it breaks down. Okay, yeah. so isotopes continue to break down over time, over time. Now, the length of time that it, it, that is taken for half of the nuclei in an element to decay is what we call its half-life, half-life, right? So there are some nuclei of elements that are very unstable, like take a uranium, for example. It's very unstable. So it, it, it gives off some particles, which are called radiations. Um, we're going to talk about some of the radiations um, after this introduction. You know, it breaks into smaller um, elements. Okay, and that breakdown is what we call radioactivity, or and we refer to the breakdown as the decay. Now, the time taken for half of the nuclei to break down is what is called the half-life. 
So every element has its own half-life. It has its own half-life. So let's say that I have an element. Let's me call it element X. Okay. If I tell you that this element, let's say, have a half-life. Half life. We use T, if you see T in half written like this, that's what it means half life. T half, such we have T half. Okay. If you have a life of this element, let's say that it is um make up something here of probably let's say five five days. Five days, okay. It means that every five days, half of this substance will break down, right? So let's assume that I start with 100 grams of this element X, okay? It means that first five days, after five days, half of this substance will be left. So we have 50 grams of the substance for the first five days. Another five days. Half of this will decay. So I'll be left with 25 grams and so on. Okay. Every five days, it's going to break down. Half of that is going to break down. So, so you can keep going. And keep going. So they can ask you a question like this. They give you a certain amount that you start with, then they give you half life, and they ask you maybe after two half lives, how many of the substances will be left. You know, so for example, this one can say that after 10 days, how much of X will be left? You know, so you, you, you break you can break it down the way I have it, you know. If you're doing chemistry, you, you can use um, other, um, there's a formula that you can also use to do to do this. But for this test, you can easily break it down using this approach. Yeah. Sometimes the question is given backwards. They give you how much is left at the end of, let's say, a certain number of days, and you have to work backwards to find the original amount. Okay. Or sometimes they ask you to find the half-life. So if you draw the diagram, you can use the diagram to work out how many half-lives were used. Okay. Um, we'll see more questions on that in the book. So this is the first introduction, half-life and radioactive decay. Then you should also know some of the different types of decay or radioactivity that we have, right? So I'm going to introduce you to two types of radioactivities. Types of radioactivity. Or let's call it um, types of radioactivity. Or nuclear reactions. Types of nuclear reactions. Okay. The first one is called um, fusion, nuclear fusion. And then the second one is nuclear fission. Okay. So have fusion and fission. Nuclear fusion, the word fusion, that means you are joining, right? So the keyword is joining of nuclei. So if you see, let's say element A combined with B to give you C, two or more elements combined to give you a big one, that's fusion joining, all right? And the nuclear fission, that has to do with splitting. You split, splitting of the nuclei. You can split the nuclei or the nucleus. Then 
that is nuclear fission. Okay, so let's say I have a big element, big nuclei breaks down into smaller components or nu smaller elements that is nu nuclear uh, fission. So fission is splitting and then fusion joining. So those are the things that you look out in chemical reactions that are given to you. Here you give the formula. Are you joining pieces or are you splitting up a big one to produce smaller ones? Yeah. So what are the type of radiations of radioactive substances that we know of? As I said, there are three main ones I want us to consider. There are more than three, but we'll consider three key ones. So let's go to this table chart here. So the first type is the alpha particle, right? That's the radioactive decay, alpha decay, the alpha decay, type of decay. So the first one, types of radiation, types of radiation. And it's alpha decay or alpha particle. Okay. The alpha particle is basically a helium atom, has atomic number of four and um, atomic number of two, sorry, and it has mass of four, two and four. Right. So that's alpha particle. So it's basically a helium atom, because helium has atomic number of two. And then a mass of four helium. Okay, so that's what you have alpha here. This one for the right like the same as writing four two alpha particle. Okay. So if the nucleus breaks down, it's going to release the alpha particle. So this is a, this is like nuclear fission. You know, releasing. Split into smaller components. Okay. Now, what you have here is a general equation. Um, A is atomic mass and Z is atomic number, right? That's what that, it means. Okay. So, this is showing that if you lose a particle, alpha particle, it means that the atomic number has to be reduced by four and then the mass number has to be reduced by two. This is what this is showing, all right? Okay, so because you can give give it a question like if you have element X, this is let's say let's say this is twenty, let's say okay two hundred, and this is let's say you have um let, let me make it something like um thirty. If this breaks down to form another element, let's call the element let's say Y. <coughs> And then it gives you an alpha particle. So it's four, two, and alpha particle. Let's say the helium. Okay. You could be asked to find the atomic mass of this and atomic number. Okay. It's pretty much easy to do. You have to remember that the sum of the charge um, atomic masses on the left side is the same as this on the right side. Sum of atomic number on the right side, the same as on the right and the left side, and so on. That's that's what you have to use here. So you go back and look at this and ask yourself: you have 200 mass over here. On this side, you have four. So what should be added to this to make it 200? All right. So it means that this number here is 196. 200 minus four. Okay. So if we add the left side. Or in the right side should be equal. Atomic numbers, you have 30 here. Now here we have just two. So what should be here to add up to 30? It means that I subtract two from 30. So this has to be 28 to balance out. Okay. So sometimes that's how the questions go. Yeah. Finding atomic masses and atomic numbers. 
you know, from the given equation. So. Then the other one, it's the alpha decay. Okay, what we call the alpha particle, uh, this one beta decay or the beta particle. So beta particle is the second example. So the beta particle basically it's an electron. So it gives us an electron. So beta particle electrons. Beta negative one charge of negative one. The mass is zero. So this is basically an electron that is given off beta particle. No. Sometimes this is written like E and then negative one and zero type of thing. Okay. Beta particle. Okay. So the same idea for the first one. This is a general equation that can be used. Okay. So A and Z can be numbers. And I can be able to find missing parts here. Okay. Then you have, I'll jump to the gamma particle here. That's the third common one. Gamma particle. So the gamma particle, we use the gamma alphabet, and that's gamma looks like this gamma particle. So it has no charge, and then the mass is negligible, zero. All right, so gamma particle is basically a neutron that is given off. A neutron that is given off. Okay, gamma particle. Okay, so these are the three common radiations that um, you should be thinking about. Um, the other ones, um, the positron, are like positive charge uh, electron here, and then and uh, these are other little ones here, but know the three. The three are the common ones that you should know. Okay, for this test alpha, beta, and gamma uh, radiations. Okay, types of radiations. Then I started to show you some properties of the radiations, what happens, how are they um, classified. The classification is based on what stops them. They have how the degree of permeation, how they can permeate or pass through objects and what we call the penetrability. So the alpha rays or the alpha particles, they can be stopped by paper. Paper can stop them, right? You know, so they are not as in intensive as the beta radiation. Beta radiations, they can pass through paper, paper, but they can be stopped by thin aluminum foil, like, sorry, aluminum, yeah, thin aluminum metal sheets, like alu aluminum can stop the beta radiations, right? Then we take gamma. Gamma can go through paper, go through the um, thin aluminum um, metal sheet, but then it can be stopped by thick lead or steel plates. Has to be thick lead or steel plates. Okay, that can stop the gamma and the X rays. Yeah. Okay. And then the other one that is called the neutron rays. The neutron rays can be stopped by um, water or concrete. Okay. So the classification is based on how they can also penetrate materials. Right. So just as I discussed, these are some examples of radioactive decay. Yeah. Like this is uranium. If it breaks down, it gives you thorium and then helium with an alpha particle. Right. And so, so that if you look at the balance, 238, you have 234 here and then four. If you add this together, you should get that. 92 atomic number uranium. The, on the right side, if you add the atomic numbers 19 and 2, you should get 92. You, 
they should balance on both sides. So if one is missing, you should be able to find the other one and so on. Okay. And then beta rad decay, these are examples. Yeah. And a spontaneous fusion, efficient splitting, a big molecule splitting to several ones. Okay. Right. So these are examples of reductive decay. Right. Right. Great. Any more questions on this before we look at this part here? Questions, clarifications? No. I'll do so far, good. Okay. All right. So we're gradually getting to the end of the science. All right, so the next one, we want to look at properties of light. Properties of light. Okay. Now, light has what we call both wave and particle properties. It can act like a wave. It can also like act like a particle, right? It's light. Um, so we, we saw the dual property of light as a dual property so either it's a wave or it could be a particle yeah. and if it's acting in the form of particles we call that photons so photons are pockets of energy for light you know, pockets of energy So if acting like a wave, then to be like those we want to talk about. Now the first property of light is reflection. So let's look at reflection. Now reflection occurs on the surface of a mirror. Okay. So the light ray is coming this way. This is called the incident ray. So if you have a light here, then the ray that comes under gets the incident ray. So hit the mirror and then it's reflected in the opposite direction, right? And this is called a reflected ray, reflected ray. Okay, so that's the first property of light. It can be reflected on the shiny surface. Okay. Now, if I draw a line perpendicular to the surface, this line is called a normal. So that's a normal line perpendicular to the surface. Okay. Then you have the angle I and they have angle R. Angle I is known as the angle of incidence. Angle of incidence. And angle R is the angle of reflection. Okay, angle of reflection. So this normal line divides, this normal line, right, um, divides angle into two core parts. So the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. They are equal. So they give you a question where they draw, they can, they can put in angles. So if this is 30 degrees, we expect this angle here to also be 30 degrees. What is the normal here? Yeah. Incident ray, incident angle should be equal to the reflected angle. Yeah. You should determine that. Okay. Then the other one is called diffraction. Diffraction. Diffraction has to do with the bending of light waves around obstacles in its path. Obstacles in its path. Okay. For example, if I have a particle here, it has to be a tiny particle for this to work. Okay. So let's say I have this particle here, like a bacteria under the microscope. Okay. Now the light is traveling in a straight line. So as it hit, it can pass through the particle. But then it can bend a little bit 
around the particle a little bit, a little bit bend, and then, you know. So this bending of light around obstacles in this path is what we call diffraction of light, diffraction of light, okay? So this is why on the microscope, the bacteria appears, let's say this bacteria, it appears dark, because the light doesn't go through the bacteria, but then you see it appears dark and then this place like a halo around it, that, like a halo of light around, yeah, because the light bends around it. You know, then you see the bacteria as dark, dark, dark objects. Okay. It's called diffraction of light. Um, another example is when light wave passes through a barrier with a small opening, it acts as a single point source from where light emerges and spreads in all direction. So another way, if you look at, there's a small opening and light passes through this, it has to be tiny. It ends up a little bending. Uh, so that's like, you see the gums are like this. It bends a little bit, bends. And that's the diffraction of light, little bend. Then the third property is refraction, refraction of light. Now refraction of light occurs when light travels from one medium to another medium of different densities, different densities. Okay, so let's say that this is air. <coughs> you have air here, now this is water. <coughs> Sure. The air has lower density than the water. So this is low density. This has a higher density. Okay. So as the light travels from the water into the air, it ends up bending a little bit from what you call the normal. So if I draw a line here, perpendicular to the surface, this we call the normal. So it's traveling, instead of going straight like this, it bends away from the normal. It bends away from the normal. You know? The bending means that the away from the normal means that it's traveling faster in the air. Light travels faster in the air than in water. So it bends away from the um, normal. Okay. So let's draw. This diagram here and show some properties. Okay. So refraction is what makes objects appear to be closer to the surface of water than it is. So if I put a coin under water, it appears as if it's closer to the surface. So this fish, instead of being deep down here, it appears as if it's close to the surface, you know, it appears here. You got the light bends and then appears as it's coming from here instead of there. Okay. So let's look at this diagram. In the lab, you can set this up using what we call a glass block. Glass block. So let's draw a normal here and then draw another normal there. So as the light comes in, shine light here. This ray is known as the incident ray. This will be the incident ray. Incident ray. So instead of this going straight in like this, it bends a little bit. It doesn't go straight by ends up bending. A little bend. 
Let me redraw the normal here. Okay. And then as it comes out, it, bend, it moves away from the normal, I guess. Okay. So this here is known as the, this ray here is known as the refracted, refracted ray. And then the ray that comes out, this is the emergent ray. Emergent ray. Okay. So the angle here will be the angle of incidence. Let's call it I. And then the angle here, R, will, will be the angle of refraction. Okay. So I is the incident angle. So this is the angle of incidence. And this R here. angle of refraction, angle of refraction, okay. So since these are two parallel lines, the normals are parallel lines, it means that this angle here will be the same as R, will be the same as R. And then the angle here will be the same as I, if it comes out, you know. But there are two parallel lines, this parallel to that. It is called the transversal. Okay. So there's something known as the refractive index. Refractive index of materials. So let's read this here. Say light travels faster in air and slow in water and slower still in glass, right? So the light, water slows it down and glass slows it down. So that's why it ends up bending closer to the normal if it's fast. The slower light is in the medium, the more, the, the slower light is in the medium, the more it refracts or bends in it, right? So it's gonna bend more if it's denser. Um, the measure of how much light refracts in the medium is called its refractive index. The refractive index, how much light it reflects. And refract, sorry, in the in the medium. So if you take air, it's around one, you know, and then water is 1.3 and glass 1.4, diamond 2.4, you know. Okay. So diamond refracts light more. Okay. So that's refraction of light. Yeah. And mathematically, we define what we call the refractive index. Refractive index. This is found by using the formula. You take sine of the angle of incident to the angle of refraction. Sine of angle of incidence I to the sine of R in degrees. That's refractive index. And this formula was determined by somebody called Snellings. We call it Snellings law. Snellings law. If you take the ratio or the sign of incident to the sign of refraction, the number that it gives you is, is refractive index. And it's different for different materials. So there's a question that asks you, how will you determine the refractive index or, um, of a material? Which of following will you need? And they have a ruler, they have um, like protractor and some other things. Yeah. So which one will you need? So in that particular one, you need a protractor. So a protractor is what you're going to use to measure um, the angles. Okay, you need the angles. Okay. Then the last property is known as dispersion. 
dispersion of light. So when we talk about dispersion, dispersion of light means that if you shine white light, right, like a sunlight, uh, we call it white light, through what we call a glass prism, a triangular glass prism, this is the triangular one, okay? When the white light passes through this, it splits it up into different colors, component colors, right? So the rainbow colors. Yeah. If you combine the rainbow colors, you get the white light and back and forth. So white light is made of different components. Um, to remember this, you can use uh, the mnemonic Roy G Vive. Roy G Vive. Roy, like somebody saying Roy G Vive. So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Okay, those are the colors that come out. Called dispersion of light. Okay. So those are the five, uh, sorry, four properties of light that you should know about. Reflection, dispersion, refraction, and diffraction. Yep, so I believe that's it for today for the science part what I want to cover. Right, any questions on what we've done so far before we go to the book to look at some problems? Yeah. No, thank you. So far, so good. Thank you, great. Right, so we'll look at some questions in the book. Um, do you want to take five minutes break now so that we can discuss questions in the book and do the math part. Yes. So let's take like five minutes break. So it's now 11.23. Let's be back um, 11.28 and then we'll, we'll continue with questions from the book. Okay. So 11.28. Okay, thank you. Okay.
Okay, I hope you've taken a little bit of rest. So let's come back. All right, so now we're gonna look at some questions on the science part. So at this moment, we've covered um, all the topics that I usually cover. So let's apply them now to problems. All right, so we go to science page and uh, um, to page 218. 218. Science 1, 218. So let's look at number one. It says that an organism with chloroplast in its cell is probably a, a heterotroph, b, an autotroph, C, and herbivore, and then D, a primary consumer, a primary consumer. So which ought to be your choice? Organism chloroplast in the cell. Yeah, it's autotroph, autotroph, correct. Because it can make its own food using sunlight photosynthesis. Correct. Now let's look at number two. We didn't talk about that, but let's do that. So what property of water allows someone to fill a glass slightly above the rim without the water flowing over? Which property is that? This question was on um, on the TV, this, the game show. Uh, which, what do you call that one? Jeopardy. We want the Jeopardy mm -hmm. questions this week. D, yeah, because surface tension is known as surface tension. Yeah. Surface tension. Then number seven. As light passes obliquely from air to water, it is bent. This bending is called A, diffraction, B, reflection, C, refraction, and D, dispersion. C. C, refraction. correct, refraction. Yep, so the key here is moving from air to water, right? It's one million to the other, and then it's bent. Great. Okay, good job so far. All right, page 220, page 220. Number 15, which group of organisms helps prevent the accumulation of organic waste in nature? A, rabbits, B, mosses, C, bacteria, and D, fans. C. C, bacteria, correct. So those are decomposers. Decomposers, correct. All right, number 16. So number 16. It says, as the eardrum is made to vibrate more rapidly, the sound is perceived as louder in intensity softer in intensity, higher in pitch, lower in pitch. So it's vibrating more rapidly. That's a key word. Say that again. Really? It says C. Really? Uh, 
Yeah, higher in pitch, correct. Yeah, higher in pitch. Okay. So the rapid vibration means high frequency, right? Several cycles per second. So it's very fast. So the, I remember high pitch, high um, high frequency, high pitch, high pitch, correct. Okay. Right now, uh, page two to one. The next page two to one, number twenty one. It says, in the food chain involving grass, grasshopper, birds, and mammals, the original source of energy is a glucose, b sunlight. C, chlorophyll, and D, ATP. Sorry. Original source of energy. Glucose, sunlight, chlorophyll, ATP. B. B, correct. Energy from the sunlight. So we're talking about producers here, right? Producer, the, the, the grass is the one that, the original source of energy from the, Sunlight, correct. Okay, let's see. Okay, let's go on to page two to six. Two two six number forty nine. The solubility of a solid in a liquid generally increases with a an increase in temperature, b an increase in pressure, c a decrease in temperature and D, a decrease in pressure. So talk about solubility. A. A, correct, an increase in temperature. If you increase the temperature, more of the substance will dissolve. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, Page 232, 232, number 12. A closed container of hydrogen gas is warmed from 20 to 25 degrees Celsius. If the volume remains the same, what will happen to the pressure in the container? A, it will remain the same. B, it will decrease. C, it will fluctuate. And D, it will increase. So a closed container of hydrogen gas is warm from 20 to 25 degrees Celsius. If the volume remains the same, what will happen to the pressure in the container? All right, say that again. Okay. B as in boy. Or D as in dog. Oh, D okay. as in dog. Okay. So, um, so now what we have here is the container is closed, so the volume is constant, right? So the volume is constant. We know that if you increase the temperature, the pressure will also have to increase. Correct. So that's correct. All right. So whose law is this? Volume constant. So that's Gay-Lussac's law, the gas law, Gay-Lussac. Okay. So at a constant volume, the pressure of the gas varies directly as the temperature, Gay-Lussac's law. Okay. So those are key words here. Temperature is changing, volume is constant here. So pressure should go up. Okay. 
to page two thirty seven. Page two thirty seven. Number thirty one. So that's a diagram um, wave of different waves. So it says that the diagram shows four different waves traveling along the same path. Which two of these waves have the same wavelength? So let's say which ones are the same wavelengths? A and B. A and B. Yes, you are right, A and B. So if you look at A and B, they coincide. A goes, A, sorry, A goes like this. And then B goes like this. So that's B and that is A. All right, so the wavelength is from here. This point, the other point, this is a wavelength for A, because it's a complete cycle. This up, down, and back. So that's a wavelength. And for B, down, up, and back. So for B, that's the same wavelength. Is that? Okay. So A and B, correct. Number 32. A flask containing 50 ml of sodium chloride, aqueous. The solvent is A, sodium plus, B, H2O, C, chloride ion, and then D, sodium chloride solid. B, because it says it's aqua. Yeah, so aqua, aqueous. So the aqueous means liquid and water, so sodium, Aqua solvent is water. So this is short form for aqueous. All right, good. Okay, what about thirty four? Thirty four says. 25 milliliters of saline solution contains five grams of sodium chloride. What percentage solution is it? What percent solution? So try that one. So five grams of sodium chloride. So this is what we call mass percent. We find the mass percent. So the mass percent. Okay. So it's the mass of the substance. Over the volume of water. That's the mass percent. So here you have five grams of sodium chloride divided by twenty five milliliters to so twenty five. So you're going to have one over, so whatever you get, you multiply by 100, and then I'll give you the answer. So that was 25% by mass. Number 33. 
no, no, so 25 is five over, that's, this is one, so no, no, this is five. So this is 20. If you divide five into 100, it's 20% by mass, 20%. Page 239, page 239, number 42. So it says in the diagram, a ray of light passes from air to glass, from air to glass. So the question is, which of these measuring instruments is needed to find the index of refraction of the glass? Then they have a ruler, B, protractor, C, balance, and then D, thermometer. So I mentioned this already, um, this Nailing's law. So we have to use protractor, you need a protractor for this. All right, try and foot 43. It says many chemical reactions occur more rapidly with platinum as catalyst. At the end of the reaction, the platinum is found to be A, increase in quantity, B, unchanged in weight, C, change into another state, and D, combined into the final product. So what do you think? B. B, correct. It's on change in weight, on change. So one of the properties of a catalyst, it does not take part in the chemical reaction. It's just there to speed up. So it remains on change at the end of the reaction. Correct. All right, number page 240. Pay 240. So that's a question on the food chain, on the food web. So let's answer 48, 49, and 50. Forty-eight, forty-nine, fifty. 49, 50. So based on the diagram, we have grass here. Go to rodents, rodents to owls, see, you got the answer. Okay, one second, then you have hawk. Then rodents also go to hawk. We have vegetables to rabbit, rabbit to snake, then snake to hawk. We have vegetables that will also go to rat rodents and rodents to snake. So this is a food web. Okay, so let's now answer the question here. So it says that the correct order of food chain represented in this diagram is the correct order. You said it was C. So you have grass, rodent, snake, and hawk. All right, that's correct. So you have grass to rodent, you follow the arrow to rodent, rodent to hawk, and then hawk to snake. Right, so that's good. You can follow those two here, you can go there, go there. Too. Correct. So we see. You make sure you can trace the arrow without lifting the pen. I should go straight to that object. All right. And then 49. A necessary member of an ecosystem not represented in this proof web is 
A, producer, B, primary consumer, C, the composer, and then the second consumer. We spoke about that too. The composers, yeah. So they are not really shown on the diagram. Okay. All right, so number 50. If vegetables were removed from this food web, which of these results would be the most probable? You take out vegetables. So now vegetables out, what would be the most probable result? So okay, vegetables is out. Then it says what? The snake population would increase. B, the rodent population would die out. C, the grass would increase. And D, the rabbit population would decrease. Okay. okay, good. So it says the rodent population would not, this is, you said B or D? I said B is in dog. That's in dog, okay. The rabbit population would decrease. Okay, let's see. If you take out vegetables, right? So the rabbit, the only source of food is the vegetable, correct? So that's correct. There's nothing else for the rabbit. So once this goes off, no food. So it made the rabbit population would go down, would decrease. Okay, that's correct. Okay. You know. But the snake population still, if you take this out, you still have food coming from rodents. So it's not going to be affected. Rodent population will die out. That's not true. But the rodents, if there's no vegetable, they still have grass, right? And the grass would increase, which is not true. God, rodents will be feeding on that. Okay. So it's with a food chain food web, you just have to concentrate on the diagram given to you. And that's why I always say it's easy to answer those questions. Great. All right. The same page, let's look at 53. Number 53. That's on the radioact radioactivity. 53. So take like a minute to see if you can come up with the answer. Say how much of 12 grams of radioactive substance with a half life for 20 years will be left after 14 years? Yeah. So just approach it the way I did mine on the lesson. So 12 grams. Any ideas? B3. Three. Okay, let's see. So, half life of 20 years. So, it means that the first 20 years, two, zero years, half of this will be left, which is six grams. Another 20 years, every 20 years, half of this will left three grams. Okay. So this is 40 years. You add this 40 years. So that's correct. 40 years. Perfect. So three grams will be left. Three grams. Okay, great. Okay. Um, okay, let's try this one. Page 243. Number eight. It says that during a lecture, a group was instructed to write the letter T whenever the instructor said the word write. 
the instructor tapped the desk every time he said the word right. After doing this repeatedly, he stopped speaking but continued to tap. Many students continue to write the letter T with each tap. Which phenomenon does this experiment demonstrate? A, conditioned behavior. B, use and disuse. C, innate behavior. And D, habit formation. Which behavior? Remember the Pav Pavlov experiment in psychology? That's very similar. So, A, of course, conditioned behavior. Conditioned behavior. They've associated the word right with the letter T. So, even though the teacher just tapped like the tap and the right, tap right and the right T. So they associate together. Similar to Pavlov experiment where the dog salivated anytime it was being fed and rang the, the bell was rang. Yeah. Okay. Um, look at number nine. Number nine. So number nine, you have A plus B giving you C plus D plus E. <laughs> and say compound A reacts with compound B to give compound C plus compound D and E as shown in the equation below. If in a closed system, seven grams of A reacts with four grams of B. So you have seven grams of A, four grams of B to give two grams of C and three grams of E. So this is two grams and three grams here. And question say, how many grams of D are produced? How many grams of D are produced? So this is missing. So what, what do you think? B. Yes, right. So remember the law of conservation of mass. Um, the sum of the mass on the left side should be put on the mass on the right side. The mass is conserved. Okay. So if I add the masses here, you have 11 grams here. So if I add this, I should also get 11. All right. So to get 11, it means that um, this is five. So it means that this has to be six grams so that i can also have 11. okay so it's b b okay. all right good all right um look at page 244 Page 244, number 11. Two forty-four, number 11. It says, which of the following statements best describes how pressure and volume are affected as a sample of ideal gas is heated in a rigid, in a rigid sealed container. A rigid sealed container. A, neither pressure nor volume will increase. B, pressure will remain constant and volume will increase. Both pressure and volume will decrease. Pressure will increase and volume remains constant.
here. See? Okay, let's see. So it says, so the keywords here are um, rigid sealed container. Rigid, rigid sealed it means that the volume is not changing. So fixed volume, right? The volume's fixed. Um, now you are, Hitting it, so I increase the temperature. So temperature is increasing, volume is constant. So it means that the pressure will have to increase, right? Temperature increases the pressure, right? So those are the answers that you have to look for. So it means that pressure would increase and the volume will remain constant. So that is D, right? D, okay. D correct. Okay, let's see if you have another one here. Page 248, 248. And this is uh, the food pyramid. Food pyramid, number 36 to 38 food pyramid. Okay, so this is what you have. So what first, if any result, would you expect if a disease decreases the population of snakes? So the population of snakes go, goes down. So what would you notice first? A, no change will occur. B, the number of green plants will increase. C, the number of insects will increase. And then D, the number of birds would increase. So what first, if any? D. The number of beds would increase, correct. All right, so if you take out the snakes, now the beds, nothing to feed on the beds, so they will increase, correct. Yeah. Uh, the 37, which ones are herbivores? So now they're asking you which level of classification. Which ones are herbivores? Green plants, C, insects, C, B, insects, C, beds, and then D, snakes, herbivores. So remember they feed on herbs, on plants. B? B, correct. So the insect, based on this, the insect feed on the plants, so they are the herbivores. Okay, correct. Then number 38. According to this pyramid, to support 100 pounds of beds, which of the following is needed? A, more than 100 pounds of insects. B, more than 100 pounds of snakes. Less than 100 pounds of green plants. And then D, 100 pounds of insects. Which one do you expect to increase? A. A, so need more than 100 pounds of insects, correct. Yeah. Always more of those below are needed than, that's why the pyramid is wider. Um, Lower down. Okay, good. Um, okay, let's just look at nine. Sorry, thirty-nine. Um, so, oxone is an allotrope of hydrogen. A hydrogen. B water. C oxygen. And D uranium. Oxygen. Or ox. I give you the answer. <laughs> okay, oxone is an allotrope of oxygen. I mean, I mean, oxygen can exist in different forms in nature. That's what allotrope. Allotrope means existing in different forms in nature. Allotrope. The element 
can exist in different forms in nature. So oxone is a typical example. It can it's oxygen in the form O3, you know. O3. Remember, oxygen can also be O2. We have O2 oxygen. Yeah. So that's allotrope. This is an allotrope of oxygen. Okay, let's see. Uh, 42. 42. A mixture such as mayonnaise is better described as. So, mayonnaise, what kind of substance is it? A, a substance. A, B, saturated, C, a solution, and D, an emulsion. So a substance. It's D, an saturated, emulsion. Yeah, emulsion, correct. So it's an example of emulsion, mayonnaise. Okay, so that's why I said no sound at different types of emulsion. Okay, um, let's look at 44 and then maybe 45. And we'll, we'll, we'll switch. Okay. A woman standing at the bus stop, 44. A woman standing at the bus stop hears the siren of an approaching ambulance. As the ambulance passes by her, she observes a shift in the frequency of the siren. The effect she heard is known as A, photoelectric effect, B, Doppler effect, C, phase shift, and then D, Einstein's effect. I'm sure you may have come across this somewhere before, the, 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 the name. Okay. Uh, the answer is D, so it's B, Doppler effect. It's called a Doppler effect, Doppler effect. So the outside ambulance passes by you, the piece as the sound is also getting further away from you. As it gets closer, it appears as if it's getting louder. You know, Doppler effect. Okay. All right, 45. 45, make a good guess. The pitch of, the, of a vibrating string depends on all of the following except. So the pitch of a vibrating string depends on all of the following except. Say A, the length of a, of a, a string. B, the amplitude of the vibration. C, the thickness of the string. And D, the frequency of the vibration. So make a good determination here. B. B, correct. Amplitude of the vibration. Okay. Amplitude and frequency are two different things. And, uh, all, um, and here you can think about uh, the guitar, the guitar string, if, if, if you want to relate that to everyday life. Um, by changing the length, you know, your pitch increases, you change the frequency. If you change the thickness, it puts a different uh, frequency and so on. You know? And we also said that frequency goes to pitch. Uh, so you can use elimination here to get the answer. All right, page 250. Page 250. Number 47. <clears throat> Number 47. As the angle of incidence of a ray of light striking a mirror increases, the angle of reflection will A increase, B, decrease, C, remain the same, D, first increase, and then remain constant. So think of the properties of the light that we discussed.
So this is an example of uh, reflection. So what happens to the angle? As the angle of incident increases, what's going to happen to the angle of reflection? So if this is here, the angle, of, remember I said angle of incident is the same as angle of reflection. They are equal, right? So if this increases, if increase angle, then it has to reflect the reflection and this also has to increase, All right? So it increases. So it should be A, increases. Okay, um, maybe let's skip to 49. It says, in the food chain, an organism that feeds on green plants is also known as, so you have decomposers, A, decomposers, B, producers, producer, C, first order consumer, and then D, second order consumer. So it's feeding on green plants. So which classification will you put it? Um, yeah, so it's the um repeat your answer again. Um, B? C, B. yeah. It's C, correct. Yeah, so it's a first order consumer. So you have the producer, first con con consumer, a first consumer. And then after that, second and so on, correct. Okay. So, okay, one more, and then I think that should be enough for the science. Page 252. 252. Number 60. So that's something, something on the light. Number 60. So have a mirror, and then you want to identify the angle. So this is 30 degrees, and then they wanted to find So this is A, B, C, and this is D. You said this is 30 degrees here. B. This is 45. Is it B? B, correct. Because this is 30. Because it has to be 30. And this one is 15. So 30, correct, because the angle of incidence should be called the angle of reflection. So it's 30, so that it should be B. It has to be in the opposite direction like this. Okay, good, but it's a mirror. It doesn't go through like that. All right, all right, all right great. So I believe you've seen a lot of problems how to answer these type of questions based on the lesson that we've done today. Um, and I know there are more problems that when you go back, go through the book and then you should be able to answer the questions based on what you've done so far. Yeah. Okay, let's... I was... Okay, there's one more question I want us to answer on the radioactive, and I will pause on the signs here. One, two, two questions here. Okay, there are two of them, two or three. Okay, page two, three, forty-three. Page two, forty-three. Number forty-six. 
No, 46. It says 100 grams of a radioactive substance disintegrates to 25 grams in eight days. I'm sorry, what yeah. page number was that? Oh, 343. 343, thank you. Yes, number um, 46. So you have 100 grams of a radioactive substance disintegrates to 25 grams after eight days. So it goes all the way to 25 grams after eight days. It said, what is the half-life of the substance? So now I want to find the half-life. So we'll see if you can come up with the answer here. So it goes all the way to 25. Grams and all this takes eight days. So it's a find a half life. Find the half life. Somebody got it? Okay. So for this question, you have to break it down into, into the half-lives. Okay, so let's go this way. So first half-life, we expect 100 grams to break down to 25. So it's 250, right? First half. So half of this will break down. First half life, 50 grams. And then another half life, 50 will go to 25. So this is taking two half lives to get to 25. Now the whole of this is eight days. So it will take eight days. That means I have to split this into two parts, eight into two. So I divide the eight by two. So we should get four days. So it means that a half life here, this is four days here, and another four days to get to 25. So it has a half life of four days. Four days. So it should be B, half life of four days. Okay. Um, So now I think you should be able to answer questions easily. If you look at page 345, there are questions that you should be able to answer. Right? 51, 52, 53, 54, you should be able to answer all of them. 51, which arrow represents amplitude in the wave? You should be able to tell the amplitude. Page 345, okay. you should be able to tell the amplitude. Which one is amplitude? Four fifty one. Amplitude, anybody? D. The maximum displacement from the starting position. So it should be A. A is the amplitude. Amplitude A. Okay. Then 53, it says, of the following, which is not emitted during radioactive decay. It's not emitted during radioactive decay. A, alpha particles. B, ultraviolet rays. C, gamma rays. And then D, beta particles. Yeah. So based on all that we've done, you know that ultraviolet rays is not a radioactive particle, you know. And then 54, you can use your general knowledge to answer that. So you have a plate 
and says a, um, a variety of subatomic particles are shot between two oppositely charged plates. So this is positive charge and negative plates, and pass the particle through this. As shown, you say which particle will not be will not be deflected, which one will not be deflected? Okay, they have protons, neutrons, electrons, and alpha particles. So which one will go through this without being deflected? That means going towards the positive or negative side. So which one do you think? Protons, neutrons, electrons, and alpha particles. Anybody? All right, so this has to be the neut neutrons are not charged. Neutrons don't have any charge on them. So it means that if you pass a neutron through this, it's just gonna go straight through without being deflected. It's a neutrons, no charge. Protons are positively charged. So you put the proton, protons will be attracted towards the negative. So they'll be deflected towards the negative charge. Electrons are negatively charged. So you pass electrons, the electron will be deflected towards the positive charge and so on. Alpha particles, Will be deflected, they are, they are, they are also um, charged, so they'll be deflected towards the negative plate and so on. Okay, right. So we'll stop here for the science, um, so we can look at some of the math problems. All right, let's go to our math so that we can finish up the questions on the math test three. We started the math test three last time. Okay, let's look at page, I think page um, 117. It's page 117. So we can we start from 117, finish up, and then tackle the next one. Number 35. We go to 35. So page 117, number 35. So 35 says that if x percent of 150 is equal to 12, what is x? So take a minute to see if you can set up the problem and then we'll discuss. x percent of 150 is equal to 12. So I say, what is x? Okay, any, anybody wants to help us with that one? Mm -hmm. 
you can work in this uh, you can approach algebra approach or you can use proportion the same proportion okay let's do this so you can say that x over 100 that's x percent off means multiplication times 150 should be equal to 12. that would be the algebra approach okay All right so if i reduce to lowest terms i can let me put this over one I can cross these zeros out, so that is gone. I can reduce this to lowest terms. I can say five here is two, five here is three. So I end up with three X over two is equal to 12. Okay. And then I can do cross product two times 12. So it's three X is equal to 12 times two. And then I can divide both sides by three. So this will cross out, so have x is equal to three into itself is one, three here is four, so x should be equal to eight. Okay, so we can do that. Okay. Or if you want to use percent proportion, you can also set up percent proportion if you want to. This to that, so x over 100 is the same as off. The off is the base, so 150 equal to that 12 that means is the is part so 12 out of 150 equal to x over 100 yeah. and then you come up with the same answer if you multiply out so 150x is equal to 1200 and then divide by you should come with the same answer it's So algebra and percent proportion approach. Okay. Number 36, I believe that one should be straightforward for you since you are dividing two fractions. If you divide two fractions, you keep the first fraction, the numerator, and then reciprocal of the denominator times the reciprocal denominator. Thirty-six. So it's nine divided by three over eight. That's what you have. Okay. So as we said, keep the first. I can put this over one. Okay. So it's nine over one. Keep that times reciprocal of the second fraction. So that's eight over three and then if you reduce the lowest terms three to itself is one three into nine is three so three times eight so that would be 24 over one okay. so the answer is d right? we the same as 24. d What about 37? Like, try 37 and give me the answer for that one. A. A. Okay. So these are like the two similar triangle, uh, rectangle problem, right? This time it's in words. So two rectangles have the same ratio of length to width. The first rectangle is six centimeters wide and nine centimeters long. So let's draw that. This is nine centimeters long, six centimeters wide. Then you have a second rectangle. It's 12 centimeters long. And the question is, what is the width? So we don't know, this is X. So since they are similar rectangles, 
we can use the ratio of the length to the width. So the ratio of this small side, the width to the length, so do width to length ratio, it should be the same, right? So width to length six, nine should be the same as the width here to the length. So X over 12. So this should be the proportion that you want to solve. Okay, so if you do this, then you have cross product, so it's 9x is equal to 6 times 12, and then I can divide by 9. x will cross out, so I have x is equal to 8, correct. So 72 over, so that's 8 centimeters, correct. So that's correct. Okay. All right, what about 30, 38? 38. 38. Two angles are parallelogram, measure 60 degrees. So a parallelogram, opposite sides are parallel. So this is parallel to that. And this is parallel to So it's 60 degrees for one here, and that's 60 degrees. Okay. So how large is the remaining two angles? So you want this angle and that, they're missing. So remember for parallelogram, opposite angles are equal, right, they're equal. Yeah. And the total angle in the parallelogram is 360 degrees, 360. So if I add all the angles, you should get 360. Yeah. So X plus X plus 60 plus 60 should give us 360 degrees. So 2X plus 120 should be equal to 360. So 2X will be equal to minus 120 from both sides. So 360 minus 120. So that is 240. And then divide by two, divide by two. So your x should be one, two, zero. So 120. Yeah. 120 degrees. Yeah. So another quick way to do this is to add 60 to 120, uh, 60 plus 60, that's 120, subtract from 360 and divide by two. That's the, that's the algebra that we've done. Thirty-nine, I believe we should be able to do that. What percent of seventy-five is five? What percent of seventy-five is five? So identify the is and identify the off and set up a percent proportion. Thirty-nine. What percent? So looking at the what percent? So the percent is unknown. X out of hundred is. So that's the part of 
something of 75, so 75. So your percent proportion should look like this. And then you can find it. Use a cross product to find X. So 75 times X is equal to five times 100. And then divide by 75, divide by 75. So your X will be equal to 500 divided by 75. And I should get the answer from there. So we have 6.666, which is two decimal places, so 6.67%. So that gives us B as our answer, B. And then 40, it says, what's the area of a triangle having a base of 10 centimeters and a height of five centimeters? Okay. So the area of a triangle will be area of a triangle. Remember, it is half base times height. One half the base times height, half dh. You've been given the base and you're given the height. So substitute. One half times the base, which is 10, times the height, which is five. Okay. I can reduce the lowest terms. One half of that, so this would be five. So we have five times five. So that'll be 25 centimeters and the unit to be cubed. Sorry, squared. So I didn't area. So it's squared, centimeter squared. Okay. So as I said, always remember the unit. Sometimes you can be given the unit in, let's say, your doing area, but they have cube. You know, so that would be wrong. The area should be squared. If it's volume, then the volume is cube. You know, so note those differences just in case they play around with the units. Okay. Right. So let's look at the other page. So for this page, let's see, we can skip some of them because there are some that you should be able to do um, easily. So let's go through the page and you can tell me if you want to answer that or we should just skip those ones. Okay. So page 118, 118, let's go through and then see if it's something familiar. Because it's almost a repetition of all the questions again, some of them, not all. Okay. So let's look at number one. It says, how many ounces or two one four fluid ounce bottles can be filled from a bottle containing nine fluid ounces? Nine fluid ounces. What do you think we should do for this question? Let's see if we, if we have to skip or we'll just do it. All right, so let me know what you think we should do. Which operation should we use here? one anybody which operation division addition multiplication divide yeah you have to divide 
you have to divide. So you're breaking down this into pieces, like the parts, right? So you have nine free ounces. That's what you have. So nine and divide that into two one fourth ounce bottles. So it's a division problem, okay. division. Okay. So since you're dividing this a fraction, you have to change to proper fraction first. So we have nine divided by, so I put this over one, so nine over one. Divided by improper fraction, that would be four times two is eight, eight plus one is nine. So it's nine out of four, okay, improper fraction. Then we'll keep the first fraction and then multiply, change division to multiplication, and then uh, flip the second fraction. So it's four over nine and then reduce to lowest terms. So nine can cross itself out, that's one. So you have four times one left, so which is four. Okay, so it means that answer is D, you have six bottles that can be filled out, six. Okay, All right, good. I'm sure number two should be fine. It should be fine number two. Okay. Number three, I guess you all should be okay. Number four should be fine. Number five, you should be fine with that. Another division of fraction. Um, let's see, number six. Okay, let's look at number six. So try number six. Number six. So a tablet contains 2.25 grains of aspirin. If a patient takes two tablets every six, every four hours, so a person is taking two tabs every four hours. So how many grains of aspirin will be taken in 24 hours? How many grains in 24 hours? Okay. So how many tablets is the person going to take in 24 hours? Every four hours, it takes two. So 24 hours, how many tablets? Six tablets. Okay. Um, six, two. Okay, so the first four hour, um, we, I'm how sorry, many? Because it's twice a day. So it's, the person is taking it um, six times a day, right? For every four hours. Twelve tablets. Yeah, so twelve tablets in a day. Because if you break this down every four hours, so within twenty-four hours, twenty-four hours divided by four, so you're gonna have six of that, six times in a day. All right, and every hour the person is taking two tablets, so it means that. A person has to take two times six. So we're giving a person 12 tablets for the day. 12 in a day. Okay. Now each yes, 27, correct. Now each tablet is 2.25 gra grains. So you have to multiply 2.25 grains times the 12 tablets. So that gives us 27 grains 
for the day. Okay, 27 grams. Okay, good. So it's D. D. So if it's six hourly, then that will be four times. If eight hourly, then that will be three times, right? Because there are eight of, uh, if for eight hours, I always make there are three of them, three of the, the eight blocks in 24 hours. If it's 12 hourly, twice a day, and so on. Got two twelves out of 24. Okay. And so on. All right, great. All right, number seven. I believe number seven should also be straightforward. You find an average weight loss. So we should go to do that one. You may average is adding all the numbers and dividing by the number of items, right? So number seven shouldn't be bad for you. Number eight, fractions, division of fractions. We've done that a lot of them. That should be good. Keep the first fraction, multiply by a second. That should be fine. Um, maybe let's look at number nine. Number nine. So it says it's a lot of fraction division, this type of problems. So let's look at number nine. What is the maximum number of one and a half inch strips of tape that but can be cut from a 480 inch roll of tape? Okay, so 480 inch roll. And then you want to cut this into one and a half strips. Okay. So if you look at this, like the one we just, uh, we did one, the, like the number one, where they're breaking the bottle down to, the fluid ounces down, is very similar. See? So you're breaking this down into this small, small part, one and a half inch labels. So it means that you have to divide, you are splitting into small parts. So you have to divide these two, okay. So as we said, you can write this 480 out of one and then divided by change to improper fraction. So it's two times one, which is two plus one. So it's three over two. Keep the first fraction times reciprocal the second one. So two over three. And then you can use a calculator or you can reduce to lowest terms if you want to, okay. So either you multiply two by two for 480 and then divide by three, or as I said, you can reduce to lower stems, whichever you feel comfortable with. So three here is one, three here will be one, six, zero. So now I have two times 160, and then that should be 320 strips. 320. So that would be C. Okay. Number 10 will be a good question to look at. So think through the problem in a minute for number 10. So an income tax system requires that persons having a net income between 10,000 and 16,000 pay a tax of 800 <clears throat> plus 24 percent of that part of income in excess of 10,000. How much tax should be paid on an income of 12,500? 12,500. Okay. <clears throat> so tax 
the 800 plus 24 percent of the excess. Above 10,000. So this is a summary of the question. So it means that in this question, you have to ask yourself, what is the excess above the 10,000? The excess above 10,000. Okay. So that means that you're going to pay 800 plus 24%, change this to decimal. So you can use 0 0.24. What's the excess here? The excess above 2000, uh, 10,000. The person gets paid 12,500. So 12,500 minus 10,000, that'll be the excess that you're gonna get here, you subtract. So it means that you need to find 800 plus, this is 2,500, 0 0.24 um, of 2,500, then you add 800 to it. Excess is 2,500. So that gives you 800 plus 600. So the person is going to pay 1400 dollars. 1400 dollars. Okay. So if you get a problem like this, you can summarize the information into a simple equation like I did. Any question on that one? No. Yeah, I believe it's fine. Um, number 11, you should be able to do that, change it to decimal. Divide seven into three, you can use a calculator as well. Number 12, number 12, you should be able to do prime number. What prime number lies between 95 and 100? A prime number is a number that has only two factors, one in itself. So that should be fine. Uh, I should be able to do that. Number 13. Number 13. I believe that you should be able to do that as well. That's a proportion, right? 30 is a proportion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, number 13, if you look at it, it's a proportion problem. So you should be able to do proportions. Number 13. Okay. A three ounce serving of corned beef hash supplies 150 calories. Approximately how many calories will be supplied in a five ounce serving? In a five ounce segment. So that is a proportion. So you have three ounces, gives you like 155 calories. So you want to set up the same ratio here ounces and then calories. Okay. So you know the ounces, five ounces. This is missing. So X proportion. Okay. Then you do your cross products. So that gives us 3x is equal to 5 times 155 divided by 3, divided by 3. So x will be 155 times 5. So this gives us 775 divided by 3. So that's 258, about 258 calories. 
Yes, it's a 2.5833333. So it's an approximation, so it's 2.8. Okay. Uh, let's Okay, so I think that should be fine here. Number 14, you should be able to do that too. A jogger travels X miles each morning. Which of these equations represents the number of days needed to jog 200 um, miles? So each morning, X miles, 200 miles. So what do you think would be the answer for this one? You want the expression for this question? Anybody? B. Um, it's B, correct. Right. So you divide 200 by each day's um, travel. Okay. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Um, number 15. That should be fine. You should be able to do 15. Number 16, I believe you should be able to do that too. Um, exponents, you add, if you're multiplying, you add the exponents, All right? Remember that part. So two times two, uh, two times three, that'll be six. And then for y squared times y to the power four, you're gonna add the exponents. So it's y to the power six. So it's six y to the power six so that's that's b okay power rule okay. and then for number 17 number 17 you want to factor out the expression you factor out the expression okay. if you look at what you have there that's difference of two squares difference of two perfect squares i'm sure you remember that part Difference of two squares. Okay. So different two squares says that if I have a squared minus b squared, if you factor this out, you take the square roots, so it's a plus b, add them up, and then subtract the two square roots and multiply them like this. Difference of two squares. Okay. So that if you have 48, 4a squared minus 49. This is a perfect square, this is a perfect square, and subtracting, so it fits under difference of two squares. So the square root, square root of 4a squared will be, square root of 4 is 2, a squared will just be a, because a times a, so 2a, and that will be 2a, plus square root of 9, and 49 is 7, and then square root of, and then the here will be minus 7, so you add and subtract. Yeah. Yeah, like this. If you're not too sure what to do, you can work backwards from the answer. Or multiply and see the answers that you have, and multiply them back and see if you can get the original. Thank you. All right, so um, I believe we can stop here. Um, number eight, you should be able to do that yourself. Uh, what fraction of salary is left for the expenses? So you have to add what you have and subtract from one, right? Subtract from one, one whole will be the total uh, fraction. So you so add and subtract. Okay. Um, so I think we can stop here and then we'll continue. One more, as I said, let's um, quickly discuss this before we go 